Kicking off our list at number 10, stealing. Stealing today, okay, I mean, it depends what you take and most of the time your family doesn't end up abandoning you in the woods, right? I mean, hopefully, right? The Vikings, they didn't play around. Materials were sparse back then. It was hard to replace stolen goods and the deed of stealing back in the Viking age had severe consequences. The Vikings believed that if you stole, you were a coward. Yeah, and I kind of agree. My bike got stolen twice growing up. Cowards? Both of them, maybe it was the same guy, I don't know. Stealing was a different kind of low to Vikings, and I'm sure many of you can see eye to eye with this, but when you steal from somebody, they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? There's no honor, there's no battle for land, no fight for property, no bout for glory. It's just a shameless act, right? Raiding and stealing were two very different concepts in the Viking age, because you're probably asking yourself, wait, didn't the Vikings do that horrible stuff where they stole everyone's land? They did, but it was different, apparently. They viewed both differently, although they sound the same in terms of brutality, and someone's losing their home regardless. A stealer would be abandoned from the clan, pushing them out into the woods for around 20 years. Yeah, all because you stole a pine nut. Way to go, Eric the Dumb. Get out of here. Number nine, rodeo. Hold on to your butts for this next one. This one I did not expect, honestly. If you were an early medieval Norseman and somebody insulted your wife, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the legal punishment afterwards it can vary, but one of the most bizarre ways to settle your beef, pun intended, was by involving a cow. Yeah, a cow. He came in, he was brought into an area, hopefully a controlled area of sorts, and that's where its tail was shaved and then covered in grease. Poor thing, had nothing to do with any of this and now he's over here. The man's shoes were also heavily greased and the cow was prodded to make it upset, right? Sounds like something Johnny Knoxville would do for fun, but it was not fun at all. The rodeo began when the man pulled on the cow's tail, like a bell being rung, like here we go, gong, and then he just got whipped away. Now this of course would upset the cow and it would thrash him about. Now if the man at this point can keep hold of the cow's tail for a specified length of time, why he passed the test of course, so then he was allowed to live on and he had to keep the cow afterwards. What a weird bonding story, imagine that. Number eight, taking lives. Yeah, what happens when you do the worst of the worst? I mean, today we dish out quite the punishment, you even get a Netflix special or something like that. But back then, somebody in the Viking age? Well, it kind of wasn't a big deal. I know it sounds horrible to say, but hear me out. Back then, as long as the convicted were open and honest about the whole situation, like say, I don't know, if somebody had challenged him to a duel, why then it's fair game. One specific case from history involved a Viking man catching his wife in bed with another Viking. Not good. You don't want to catch your wife in bed with anyone, let alone a Viking. That's game over. His feet are hanging off your bed. You're like, oh, he's so large. No. That Viking man at that point could the fella in bed, but he had to bring that bloody sheet to Viking court. That would have to provide as evidence to show what happened and where and why. Know what I mean? That's simple. Today, there'd be a few more steps involved in that case, obviously. But the Viking age, this case was closed. That's it. They're like, okay. Viking law is done, go home. Someone go raid a village. Number seven, hot-headed. All right, here's the deal. We're doing a list on Viking punishments, so as we go on, yeah, we're gonna get darker and darker with our content. For example, one method of punishment in the later Viking age also happened to spread alongside Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity, so there's some thoughts and some actions, some questionable thoughts and actions going on in history. And this punishment was referred to as an ordeal by fire. This would involve the accused undergoing some painful exposure to heat. Maybe you drown in flames, maybe you have to eat some sort of fire or flame situation. I don't know. Either way, it was all terrible and it was very, very hot. They would have your hand put into a vat of boiling water or oil or sometimes make you walk across hot coals. And you can only imagine how creative people were getting back then, right? You don't even want to know the rest. Can't even say what happened on YouTube. Use your imagination. Hit that thumbs up and use your imagination. Number six, piece by piece. Okay, what's worse than ordeal by fire? Well, probably amputation. I'd have to go with the latter for sure. That's, it's close. Most definitely. In Viking societies, punishment was often dependent on status. The higher your status, the harder and longer your punishment was. High status folks got some pretty horrible stuff happening to them, honestly. If a thrall carried out a robbery at their master's command, well then it was the master that was punished. So instead of a quick death, they would amputate something. That's horrible. Yeah, continue being a royal, but now your life is going to be much harder. A real life example of such was not the Danish king of England back from 1016 to 1035. Now the king put in place a horribly grim law that thankfully died with him, but it stipulated back then that a woman committing adultery must lose her nose and ears, while men were merely 
chastised. I'd have been close to being fair at all. Now a thrall who would kill their master back then and then tried to run away were to have their arms and legs amputated afterwards. They weren't executed per se, but they could barely survive afterwards. I think I'd rather die at that point. That sounds terrible. In our number five spot today, we have Alfheim. This is actually a location that is said to be one of the nine worlds in Norse cosmology. The nine worlds are often highly debated, and this one is only mentioned twice in the Old Norse texts, but it is a very important place nonetheless. This place is said to be an abode of the elves, which are a class of demigod-like beings from this pre-Christian mythology and religion. Since this place isn't talked about very much in the text, there isn't a lot that is known about it, but it is said that only light elves live here, while dark elves live down in the earth, and that these two kinds of elves are unlike in appearance, but even more unlike in nature. This gets even more concerning when we take into consideration their description. Light elves are described as being luminous and, quote, more beautiful than the sun. Dark elves, on the other hand, are said to be blacker than pitch. Either way, the light elves are the ones who inhabit the land of Alfheim, and the land itself is looked over and ruled by the Vanir goddess, Freyr. Number four, horned helmets. When you think of Vikings, you probably imagine a very large man, right, with a giant beard, wearing armor, covered in fur, and perhaps a helmet with a couple of horns sticking right out on the side. Nice and nice and aggressive. We see Vikings depicted this way in movies, television, you name it. But was it historically accurate? Nay. No. False. Not really. Well, aside from looking cool, this would have served no purpose in, you know, an actual combat. Unless there was a guy specifically headbutting individuals, the horned helmet was not historically accurate at all. The horned helmets were only introduced into Norse culture when costume designer Carl Emil Doppler made them for Norse themed operas in the 19th century. So yeah, false. They just wore their heads. So big Viking heads. In our number three spot today, we have Niflheim. This is a type of hell that comes from Norse mythology. And rather than being a fiery pit, like a lot of us think of when we think of hell, it's actually a frozen landscape. This place is ruled by Hel, who is the goddess of death and the daughter of Loki. It is actually believed that her name might be where the name for the Christian underworld came from. I feel like I mentioned Christianity a lot in this. I don't know why. It's just a coincidence. Niflheim is located next to the shore of corpses, which is where Nidhogg lives. If you're wondering who that is, it's of course only the giant snake that feeds on the dead, because why not, I guess? There are said to be nine worlds in Norse mythology, and Niflheim is the deepest and darkest one. It is said that souls are brought here by Hell's messenger, and from here the souls are simply just kept in constant pain. Number two, go berserk. Unlike the fancy horned helmets, Viking berserkers were real. That part was historically accurate. And let me tell you, these guys specifically, they were terrifying. These Viking warriors would arrive to battle decked out in bearskins. Now the term originally meant to change form, right? Berserker, to change form, transformers, right? All the same kind of combat. So they were emulating a bear while walking into combat. Imagine being the other guy, you'd be scared shitless. Berserkers were considered a higher power when it came to battle. Yeah, no shit. They were the big dogs, or more accurately as they were described back then, mad dogs. More often than not, berserkers could take an opponent down with one single strike. How did they do it, right? Besides having a large build naturally, how did they win so many battles? How were they relied on so often? Today we have an idea of what may have helped aid the fight. And it's uh, it's bad stuff. It's all illicit substances. Yeah, they would just do some not so great stuff and then run into battle screaming, hopped up on something. The odds that berserkers were on something going into every battle, those odds were pretty high. They're pretty high. In our number one spot today, we have Ragnarok. Also known as the Doom of the Gods, we can't fully appreciate this new god of war without really knowing what this story is portraying to some degree. Ragnarok would have been the most feared word for the Norse, or perhaps a word that changed their outlook on the world. This was a fate that no one, not even Odin, could escape. At the time, there was a belief that there were different ages, the axe age, the sword age, the wolf age, so on, before the world would fall. There would then be three years of absolute chaos that included famine and sickness, and following this would be an all-out war in the heavens. This war would would see the gods facing everything. Yotuns, giant wolves, giant serpents, and most importantly, Loki, who broke free from his chains and was ready for revenge. This fate saw the fall of the gods and the fire giant Surt burned the entire world to ashes, killing almost every living thing. While this is a super depressing fate to believe the world will meet, there 
was a glimmer of hope. After Ragnarok, there was rebirth. It was believed that a new world would arise from the ashes. At number 10, cutting fingernails. Each civilization had their own specific beliefs, religions, and rites. For the Vikings, their belief in Norse mythology impacted a lot of their daily lives and even their burial rituals. One specific prophecy from their religion depicted the end of the world, and as anyone would, they tried to avoid that at all costs. In Norse mythology, Ragnarok was their version of the end of the world, and during this event, it was foretold that a lot of stuff was gonna happen, like giants and demons approaching and attacking the gods, and a ship called Nagfar would carry a fleet of giants. This ship was said to be made of the fingernails and toenails of the dead, and the bigger the ship, the more giants would come. Out of fear of this happening, the Vikings took every precaution to prevent Ragnarok and subsequently the arrival of this fingernail ship. To do this, the Vikings built into their burial rites a very important step, cutting the fingernails of the dead. The Vikings had to remove the fingernails of the dead so that they couldn't be used to build the giant ship, but other than their removal, no one really knows what they did with said fingernails. The Vikings were also said to have kept their own fingernails clean as to prevent the same outcome. At number 9, teeth filing. Many civilizations had body modifications as part of their culture through time. Mesoamerican civilizations were known to shape their skulls and alter their eyes, women in China altered the shapes of their feet for many years, and so many cultures around the world adorned themselves with tattoos, piercings, and scarifications. In Viking culture, their body modifications often included dental work. Evidence suggests that some Vikings filed horizontal lines into their teeth, and some of them filled those grooves with red dye to make themselves look even more terrifying. Because the Vikings were known to be voyagers traveling the seas to new lands, some anthropologists believe that the Vikings may have picked up their idea for dental modification after making contact with people in West Africa, as many tribes over there were known to file their teeth into different shapes. Would you guys ever do something like this, or would you rather leave that up to the Vikings? Now before I continue telling you guys about the weird and crazy things that the Vikings did, let me first ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe also consider subscribing to the channel to see more awesome videos like this one. At number 8, Carbon Monoxide. The Vikings were pretty good builders, mainly of ships. Their ships were huge, intricate, and very impressive, but where they excelled in shipbuilding, they lacked in the construction of their homes and community buildings. Apparently, the longhouses that they built for their communities were actually pretty unsafe to be in and trapped a lot of toxic gases inside of them. Researchers from a university in Denmark recreated one of the Vikings longhouses and lit a fire in the center of it, like the Vikings would have done back in the day. After simulating an average living environment and monitoring the atmosphere inside of the longhouse, they realized that there wasn't enough ventilation to prevent carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide from building up inside. This would have led to a lot of people getting sick, especially those who spent long periods of time inside. The Vikings didn't know that though, but they also had their own remedies for curing sickness, so I don't think that they would have thought much of it. At number 7, Onion Soup. Speaking of Viking home remedies though, they had some pretty interesting ones. Every civilization had their own takes on medicine and healing their sick and injured, and the Vikings were no doubt the same. For them though, soup was their tool for healing, and for x-rays. Sort of. These days we eat soup when we're sick to warm up our bodies and balance out our sodium levels, and doctors have actually proven that eating chicken soup actually does make you feel better when you have a cold, but Vikings didn't really have the same idea. For them, onion soup was their thing, and they used it to diagnose people. Viking healers would make up a pot of really strong onion soup and feed it to a warrior who had a wound around their abdomen. Once the person drank the soup, the healer would see if they could smell the soup through the wound. If he could, then the wound was fatal and there was no sense in trying to save the person, so they would just move on to the next warrior. It saved the healer time trying to attend to everyone, but it kinda sucked for the person who got left behind, because not only are they not going to make it, but their last meal was that awful onion soup. At number 6, Blood Eagle. We all know that the Vikings were a ruthless group of people, but their methods of execution really painted a clear picture of how terrifying these guys were, and how they had a colorful imagination when it came to imagining new ways to unalive somebody. The Vikings came up with a method of execution called the Blood Eagle, and yes, it is just as terrifying as you would expect with a name like that. The Blood Eagle basically involved cutting someone up to make it look like an eagle. 
They would cut apart the rib cage and then spread it apart to make it look like wings. And then after that, while this person was still alive, mind you, they would pour a salt solution over the wound, pull out the lungs, and arrange them over the rib cage to, again, make it look like wings so that this person could flutter away into the afterlife. Now the mysterious part of all this is that historians aren't exactly sure if this was actually a real method of execution or if it was just embellished in Viking records to make them sound cooler. I for one hope that it wasn't actually real because that sounds brutal, but when it comes to Vikings, you never really know. Number five, Holder. Okay, picture this. You're walking through a forest in Norse mythology. Nice. Doing as you do. Boy, what a nice forest this is, you say to yourself. I sure am grateful for the tree of life and Odin and all that stuff I have because of the such nice things because I pray to them. <laughs> don't, don't hurt me. When all of a sudden you spot a lady in the woods and hubba hubba, she's gorgeous. She lures you in. She thinks you're handsome and doesn't care about your receding hairline, beer belly, and the big toenail that you should have got checked by a doctor months ago. I'm calling a lot of people out there. She wants you to marry her. Sounds too good to be true, right? Guys, come on, you know what I'm talking about. But you gotta be careful though, guys. You gotta, can't be, you know, you gotta be careful. Because if you saw her cow's tail before you married her, she keeps it, or so the story goes. So yeah, they were ladies in the forest with cow tails. You had to marry them, and if you saw their tails before you were married, she'd have it for the rest of life. Makes sense. Sure. Number four, elves. Elves, everyone loves elves, especially that, that movie, Elf. Everyone loves that one. It's like it became an instant Christmas classic, crazy. The population of elves seems to significantly increase when there's a fan expo in town. Go figure. Elves in Norse mythology represent a small divine figure, similar to the dwarves. They are creators of valuables and smithers and had their strong place in mythology. And for some reason, when the elves were no longer needed in the land of Vikings and Mead, they went to go work for a fat man in a red coat in the North Pole. And before you even ask, yes, even Father Christmas has his roots in, in Norse mythology. And yes, before you ask, I know him personally, and I will be telling him who's naughty and nice this year. Christmas might be far away, but I'm watching. Ooh, we're watching. Don't you worry, me and Santa Claus. Ooh. Number three, Kraken. This one actually surprised me. I, I didn't know this. I wasn't expecting this to be Norse. But yeah, the Kraken. In a nutshell, the Kraken is a huge octopus or squid-like creature that preys on the poor and doomed sailors who dare cross its path. Now, I'm sure a lot of you fear the deep water because, well, you can't see the bottom of it. And, and I think that's a rational fear. The reason for that, of course, is because you don't know what's big chilling at the bottom of that water. The answer, it's the Kraken. That's horrifying. Using its large tentacles, it wraps itself around ships and brings them down to Davy Jones' locker. Or at least that's what happened in Pirates of the Caribbean. That's how I get my knowledge. In Sun Norse Tales, the Kraken is as big as an island. Yeah, if you see an octopus just as big as an island, just turn the boat around at that point. There ain't nothing on the boat that's gonna deal with that business. Just turn it around. Just turn the boat around. We're out of here. We're leaving. Just walk it up. Number two, Droger. Okay, let me paint a picture for you. It's a late summer night in 2011. You're a couple inches too deep into your favorite couch. A calming music plays as you traverse the lands of Skyrim. You come across a door and begin to explore what untold riches you will find in this dungeon, except the first thing to greet you is an undead creature with pale gray flesh and eyes that glow blue like the sea. It charges you with a sword and gives off a grunt that sounds like your dad choking at an all-you-can-eat buffet. You slay the beast and try to read its name. Uh, dro Droger, Droger, Drogas, Droger, there's no vowel there, Droger. You've unlocked a new ability, dyslexia. Okay, so maybe that was my story, but the Drogers are the focus here. Skyrim is heavily influenced by Norse mythology. Droger is one of those things. They were undead creatures that would protect the tombs and graves from looters, as a lot of the warriors at the time were buried with such valuables. And yes, I when, when I go into dungeons, I tip over everything. The, the, the pots, the, the wall, I check everything, gotta check everything. Number one, Valkyries. Oh yes, the beautiful Valkyries. For such a gorgeous image, they have a rather grim job. Whenever someone falls in battle, it's up to these ladies to guide them to the afterlife. In a way, they're kind of like battle angels. It literally translates to chooser of the slain. I hope you folks have been praying towards Odin, otherwise you won't be able to make it to Valhalla, which is bad because that's where all the good little Viking men and women go. You want to go there so they can be with their ancestors and eat and drink meat all day, and you want that. I know you do. 
All right, number 10, Thor goes fishing. Jormungan was yet another one of Loki's creative offsprings, born to be the destroyer of Thor during Ragnarok. In order to prevent this, they threw the great beastly serpent into the water and it was supposed like to hold the world together until Ragnarok. But Thor was a little scoundrel and didn't mind risking it all. Ajir and Ran, two lovely, hospitable giants, as I heard, agreed to host the gods for an immaculate feast. But when Thor arrived, he consumed two of the three cows that they had brought for the feast. They were like, Thor, dude, that was supposed to be for everybody. So they're like, okay, I guess we're gonna have to go fishing the next day. Then Thor slaughtered one of their biggest bulls to use for bait, which also sucked, but that was gonna be okay. He was gonna be strong for fishing. Anyways, they get out into the waves, and while the one giant gets two whales, Two whales! Thor heads out further with a bigger game on his mind. Jormungan was, after all, beneath the waves. He cast his line out, and sure enough, he got a massive bite. The force was so immense that it pulled his feet through the boat, and the serpent's head was like <laughs> coming up through the boat, about to bite him. Thor had his hammer ready to slay the beast, his mortal enemy, but then the giant cut the line because he got scared, and the serpent slithered back into the water. Then Thor was so mad, he threw him overboard. Literally, the worst guest to have at a party. Eats all your cows, almost causes Ragnarok, and then throws you into the ocean with a giant serpent at the bottom. All right, at number nine, good laugh. We all love a good laugh, right? Well, apparently a good laugh is what saved the Norse gods from facing vengeance from the giantess Skadi. You see, the gods killed Skadi's father and she demanded vengeance, but after a lot of negotiating with her, they were able to talk her out of that and instead offered her three things as reparations. The first was a husband of her choosing, however, she could only choose him by his feet for some reason. Don't ask me why. The second was having her father's eyes memorialized in the stars, and the third was just a good old laugh. Out of Scotty's three reparations, the hardest task was making her laugh. The gods tried everything to get a giggle out of the giantess, but nothing seemed to work. That's when Loki, the trickster god, came through and was basically like, step aside boys, let me handle this. And he sure did handle things. Loki then brought in a goat, tied a rope to it, and tied the other end to his nads, and proceeded to play tug of war with the goat. Like that. Both Loki and the goat screamed out in pain, as you can imagine, and Loki collapsed. And that is what made Scotty laugh. Number eight, a little bit of incest. Why not? Can we even do a list about mythology without mentioning incest? No, not probable. Why? Because, I don't know, the gods loved it. And people needed to populate the earth back then, so it wasn't too far fetched of an idea. Anyway, even though Norse mythology doesn't love the idea of incest, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. The goddess Signy fell into a pretty crummy marriage, and so to solve her situation, incest. She was married to Sajir and didn't like him because one, not a nice guy, and two, not manly enough for her. He also was a terrible husband. He killed her father and all of her siblings, except for one. Not cool, man. But the one that did survive, they teamed up to overthrow her hubby. Her two sons joined in, but they weren't ruthless killers and completely failed at all the times they tried to kill her dad. So, so she needed to up the ante, and that meant keeping it in the family. So she slept with her brother for three nights in order to spawn the force that would rid her of her husband. This son, when it came to fruition, knew what it was up and eventually assassinated her husband. Does this remind anyone of like a certain god origin story in Greek mythology? Let me know in the comments if you're thinking what I'm thinking. At number seven, Loki the mayor. When it comes to gods sleeping around with everyone and everything, Loki gives Zeus a serious run for his money. There are tons of stories about Loki hooking up with gods, people, and just about every other living thing. One of the weirdest stories about Loki's escapades is how he once had a night in the woods with a horse. Basically, the story here is that there was a horse that he really liked, a stallion named Svaldafari. Svaldafari was a horse who belonged to a mason worker who just so happened to be a giant. This giant really didn't like the gods and wanted them to just go away, and so Loki offered to help by distracting the giant's horse. Not really seeing how that's actually helping, but go off, I guess. Loki transformed himself into a mare, and then he and Svaldavari went off into the woods to mate. Horse Loki ended up getting pregnant and gave birth to an eight-legged steed named Sletnir. Sletnir then became Odin's steed, and this monster horse was actually featured in the Thor movie, so next time you watch it, keep an eye out for Loki's weird monster horse child. Number six, giant cloud brains. 
I do love gazing up at the clouds, making up stories like that's a dragon, that's a chariot, that's a bumblebee. No one knew thousands of years ago that clouds are just dense collections of water vapor floating through the atmosphere. So when they saw things in the cloud, they thought they were real. So in a way, it kind of makes sense. According to Norse mythology, the world was made up from human severed body parts, specifically of the giant Ymir. His blood turned into the oceans, his flesh became the land, his bones the mountains, his teeth the rocks, his hair plants, and his eyelashes became Midgard. So as much sense as that makes, the clouds were his brains. His skull was tossed up into the sky, held up by dwarves, they're still up there. His brain was tossed separately, and that made the clouds. Number five, the first raid. The first official Viking raid took place in 793 AD. These Viking raiders left such a huge mark on history that we refer to this time period as an age. Just like the Middle Ages, we have the Viking Age. It officially lasted from 793 to 1066, the year of the last big Viking battle. I said I'll get into that later on. I didn't. I just talked about hockey and slap fatten. Departing from agrarian pagan Scandinavia, settlers and traders rolled up to England and they arrived in Lidensfarn, and then from then on they just invaded hundreds of settlements. Now English kings were ruling over coastal areas at the time and they needed to start making defense plans from all these seagoing pagans that everybody's now talking about. Imagine hearing about pirate vikings, I'd be like, what, who are these, they have what, beards and axes? Number four, Viking funerals. Now, I know this isn't messed up per se, but I really wish that we still did Viking funerals. They would be way more fun, I don't know, instead of carrying that 900 pound casket down that aisle for like 14 city blocks, Vikings would do it in one of two ways, and both were pretty epic to witness, I'm sure. One way, they would bury the body, the classic, right? They would leave stone circles around the shallow graves that they dug, or do these burial mounds, or grave fields, usually after a battle. Vikings were pagan, they believed that the more smoke there was during a cremation, the better. The smoke was their way of reaching the afterlife. Boats also symbolized safe passageway to the afterlife in Norse mythology, so Vikings would shape these stones around the grave like a ship or a boat. But high ranking Norsemen, they would be buried with their boats. In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women, and this ship vessel was massive. It was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide, had 15 oars on each side. It was discovered in Norway on a farm, so the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, that sadly wasn't common. It wasn't a thing at all, really. Because if you missed, you just gave away the Osberg and you botched the funeral. Way to go. I know, sorry, I know. Number three, hit the slopes. Vikings didn't invent skiing by any means, but they did make it cooler. The name skiing actually comes from an old Norse term that means to stride on skis, and Viking would hunt on these skis. They got so good at hunting down elk on these skis that a law had to be written in order to protect them from going extinct. That's how good they got. The Gulathing Law of 1274, it was written in Norway, and it outlaws the hunting of elk while on skis. You probably read that and you're like, who the, what? Skiing was such a big advancement for Vikings that there's two Norse gods involved in the sport. We have Ullr, the god of snow, and Skadi. Imagine these two showing up in the next Thor movie. Game over, man, take my money. Number two, rap battles. I'm currently in the middle of Netflix Rhythm and Flow series. It's a great time, I'm loving it. It's like American Idol, but for rap. Like, hi, that's amazing. Rap battles today are nuts. They're crazy, they're intimate. Rap battles today are so impressive, but imagine getting schooled by a Viking yeah, you heard me. Imagine a Viking battling you and then just destroying everything that you care about after destroying you with words. You got a twofer. During those olden days, you needed a way to pass time. If you couldn't play hockey or slap fatten, and there weren't any villages to destroy, you always had poetry. Fighting comes from the Old Norse term flyta, which means provocation. Insult, exchange, but make it theater. Norse literature really has tales of their gods fighting. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya. I'm like, come on, he's got this. It's hometown advantage. It wasn't to see who can diss the other's hometown the hardest, really, per se. This is actually a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast, enjoying roast while watching a roast. We love it. This was entertainment in the 15th and 16th century Scotland. Now we have, well, this. We just have me ranting about flighting. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. I'm doing my best. And finally, number one, go berserk. Whenever you're playing a video game or like Assassin's Creed Valhalla per se, that health bar at the top starts to glow and you're ready. For a brief second, you can go beast mode and then everyone can hit you with arrows and nothing happens, right? You go berserk. 
Most games have this in some way, but did you know Berserkers were a real thing in history? Just like Thor and Loki and everything else, apparently? Those Norse warriors would arrive to the battle decked out in bearskins. The term means to change form. So these guys were considered a higher power when it came to these battles. So you gotta call in the big dogs, or as they were described back then, mad dogs. They could take an opponent down with just one hit, and today we have an idea of what may have helped the fight. The odds that the guys were on something, be it mushrooms, maybe they were hammered, are pretty high. Pun intended. Starting our list off at number 10, the disappearance of the Norse. Norse mythology is fascinating yet mysterious, of course. They settled in Greenland around 1000 AD and they settled for over 400 years and then just like that, they disappeared. But not without leaving their mark first. Vikings invented hockey, they skied, women had a large amount of rights compared to what we usually see on this channel, right? That's a given. But one of life's greatest mysteries is where Greenland's Vikings went. Like I said, they disappeared, right? The only remains that are left are crumbling church walls that were used for not even 500 years. This is baffling. Archaeologists are still unsure of what happened to the Norse population. Maybe it was a plague, maybe it was the Inuit, or perhaps they settled back in Europe. Again, it's really hard to tell. Recent excavations provide hints that they settled in the West, most likely relying on trade to survive. So maybe they followed the goods and then they left naturally. Who knows? They used to call hockey Nataliker. That's, uh, that's all I know, personally, so. In our number nine spot today, we we have the creation myth. Going right back to the beginning of things, the Norse believed that the universe emerged from an empty space separating the world of ice and fire. The first creature to come into being in the Norse creation myth was the giant called Emer. He is said to have been born from the moment the fire from Muspelheim and the ice from Niflheim met in the abyss of Gunyan Gaga. Emir had the ability to conceive asexually and his offspring spontaneously sprang from his armpit sweat and his legs. This is how Ymir became the mother and father of the Jotuns, who would later go on to become the enemies of the Norse gods. But eventually, Buri came into existence. Buri went on to have the grandchildren Vili, Ve, and Odin, we all know Odin, who decided to create the world and fill it with life. But unlike the Christian ideals and concept, the Norse deities couldn't just create life out of nothing. So naturally, they just killed Ymir and made the world out of his body. The sky was made from his skull, his brains became the clouds. Clouds. His blood turned into the oceans and his teeth were mountains and rocks. This gave even more power to the three brothers who then gave life and intelligence to humans. This creation story is thought to have really influenced the way that the Norse saw the world. They were living in a universe that was only made possible by death. Number eight, Norse or Viking. You may have asked yourself during this video already or at some point in your life, what is the difference between Norse and Viking? I watched Norsemen and now I wanna bark at dogs. That's my new dream job, just to bark at people all day, I guess. Norse and Viking both referred to the same group of people who both settled in Scandinavia in the medieval times. Now this all happened again around 1000 AD. The Norse are Norsemen, right? Guys who bark at dogs, you know, all that kind of stuff. The Vikings are also Norsemen, but they're just a little younger and a bit more, you know, a bit more energetic. A lot of this, a lot of this. A lot of height, you know what I mean? The Vikings were seafaring warriors while the Norsemen were involved in farming and trade and that sort of stuff. So there you go, now you know the difference. In our number seven spot today, we have golden apples. Golden apples are an incredibly important part of Norse mythology because of the fact that they need to be continually eaten by the Norse gods in order to maintain their immortality. It's not just like a free ticket, all right? They gotta consume a lot of golden apples. The apples also supplied the gods with their strength as well as their forever youth. The orchard that contained these apples was looked over by the goddess of spring, Idjin. I don't know how to say that, so I just went for it. The apples are extremely important to the mythology and in one story, when the goddess gets tricked into giving herself and the apples over to Loki, the gods immediately grew old and weak, but luckily she was returned and everyone's youth was restored. This led people to search for these golden apples at one point. Like, real humans. But even if they were to find one of these magic apples, you'd need a constant supply in order to maintain your immortality, and that might be more difficult than you think. Number six. Viking funerals. I really wish we still did Viking funerals. You know, every funeral I've been to in the last five years, it's all been a snooze fest. I'm like, yeah, they're old, we get it. Josh Groban, sure, let's change it up a bit. Where are all the horns? Where are all the flames? I wanna feel like I'm at a Greta Van Fleet concert, right? Viking funerals came in many different shapes and sizes. Sometimes they would bury the body and leave stone circles around the graves. That's pretty bad. Or sometimes they would do burial mounds. That's also pretty bad. Vikings were pagans. 
and so they believed that the more smoke during a cremation, the better, seeing as smoke was their way of reaching the afterlife. And in Norse mythology, boats symbolized safe passage to the afterlife, so Vikings would shape these stones placed around the graves, they would shape them like a vessel. Or these mounds would be shaped like giant boats of some sort, which is again, pretty epic. Beats Josh Groban every time. But high ranking Norsemen, that's where the fun comes into funeral. High ranking Norsemen would be buried with their actual real life vessels. Yeah, they'd be buried with their ship. Imagine that for a visitation, you'd be like, oh my God, how do I even get in? In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women. The ship vessel was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide, 15 oars on each side. It was massive. It was discovered in Norway on a farm. So again, the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, it wasn't actually that common as badass as it is. Because if you missed, well, you just gave away the Osberg and you also botched the funeral all in one so, way to go. Number five, Thor's hammer. It's kind of hard not to talk about the Avengers movies because when you think of Thor and his hammer, it's really hard to not think about the handsome Hemsworths or the imagery from the movie. The story of Thor's hammer is rather interesting, however. So, Loki, being the trickster that he is, gave a competition to the master dwarfsmiths to create gifts for the gods. After enough gold to keep Scrooge McDuck happy and a sailboat that could fit in your pocket, uh, the hammer was revealed. Mjolnir, a hammer that would never shatter, always hit its mark and return to Thor when thrown. Considering how many times Thor has thrown his hammer at his brother and his foes, I feel like it's safe to say that Loki's plans kind of backfired. Yet again, his plans backfire a lot actually. Number 4. Holder Holders are seductive creatures found in the woods, and if you thought they were scantily clad women, then you would also be correct, because why not? The name derives from covered or secret. Also, it may have something to do with mermaids. Obviously no fish tails here, but uh, similar creatures nonetheless. It's also said that if the holders are treated with respect, then they can be nice to humans, which is good. I like when things are nice to humans. Apparently fond of charcoal kiln burners and would respect them if they were left provisions. Not sure what a creature like that would want with charcoal, but... I don't know, maybe to keep warm because they're not wearing very much, I guess? Sure. This all sounds great, right? Well, maybe because some of them are looking to marry. Hubba hubba, let's go. Uh, trouble is, she's got a cow's tail. Guess that's better than a fish body, but if you see her cow tail before getting married, then she keeps the cow tail. Some of these tails are just insane. Number three, elves. Everyone loves elves. The population of elves seems to significantly increase when there's a fan expo in town. Hmm, go figure, I wonder why that is. Hmm. Elves in North mythology represent a small divine figure. Similar to the dwarves, they are creators of valuables and have their strong place in mythology. And for some reason, when the elves were no longer needed in the land of Vikings and Mead, they went to work for a fat man in a red coat in the North Pole. And before you even ask, yes, Father Christmas has his roots in North mythology. And yes, before you ask, I know him personally, and I will be telling him who's naughty enough. Nice this year. Number two, Kraken. I always used to think the Kraken was something Johnny Depp and Davy Jones had to deal with, but that's just not the case. I mean, this is the reason why I have a fear of water I can't see the bottom of. Look, I have no fear of water and I have no issues swimming. I'm actually a surprisingly good swimmer. Chris would be surprised. But good swimmers or good sailors alike are no match for the Kraken. The Kraken is a large squid or octopus-like creature that preys on doomed sailors and ships. Using his large tentacles, he wraps himself around your vessel and pulls you to the cold depths below. Horrible. Some Norse depictions of the large suction cup beast are as big as islands. Maybe with enough hand holding and teamwork, you could take down a giant squid or octopus. Sure, maybe. Why not? But we're trying to take one down the size of an island? I don't think it's happening, dude. There's no shot, dude. I don't think so. Big as an island? You're gonna need a spear like this big. That's big. Number one, the droger. The unliving, the deceased past your expiration date. It is the end of a journey that we call life, and it seems pretty much every culture we have dealt with has had the most respect possible. A lot of ancient civilizations had their way of paying respects and staying close to the ones that they love, even in the afterlife. The Droger, similar to the ones you find in Skyrim, are undead creatures with gray flesh that protect the tombs that are filled with gold and valuables from potential looters and robbers, and maybe the occasional dragonborn. Oftentimes, a lot of warriors were buried or put in such tombs, which means a lot of loot and ceremonial blades to commemorate the life of the warrior in question. I'm curious, folks, let us know if you had to be buried with something that you just can't part with even at the afterlife, what would it be? What would it be for me? I'd say video games, but I don't know. It might be some Lego or something. I'm, 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 let me some Legos, bro. Let me some Legos. Number 10, Ragnarok. I don't want to set the world on fire, 
I just want to start a flame in your heart. Yes, the end of times. It's all over. So long as I'm here for your entertainment, everything is going to be okay. Ragnarok is the prediction of end times. All ancient civilizations did this. Maybe we just like talking about it. Maybe we just like thinking we're all doomed. Maybe we're just all a little emo. Who knows? I don't know. Ragnarok is slightly different from other world ending predictions as instead of one event, it's a series of events that signals the beginning of the end times. As a gamer, it was kind of like watching Call of Duty fall off. Things were great in Black Ops 2. Things were good, lots of good maps, fun weapons, perks. It was great. But then they added jetpacks, and you, know, you knew it was the beginning of the end. A good thing we never get close to that in real life, though, right? That's, everything's fine. It's good right now. It's good. <laughs> Number nine, Boulder. If you know your myths and your ancient stories, then you know that there's some stories that are very different from culture to culture. However, there's also a lot of similarities. The story of Boulder is both. Very similar to Achilles, that is. A dude has been given the gift of invulnerability. I am invincible. Pretty sick. Achilles had a weakness. It was his heel. And Balder? Well, it was a it was a mistletoe. Every guy has his weakness, but yeah, it was a mistletoe. And Loki made a dart out of it, and, and then the dart got thrown at him, and then everyone was sad, it was kind of a mess, and yada yada. I'm sure this won't have any effect in our world. Why is the ground shaking? Number eight, Loki. Lord of the Tricks, the god of mischief. Everyone knows who Loki is, most likely due to some very successful superhero movies in the last few years. But the same may know him regardless, known for many tricks and evil deeds. His best trick, or whatever you want to call it, uh, was his shape-shifting. Loki has the ability to transform into any creature and any gender. And for the people who don't have the ability to see through these tricks, it often leads to a lot of misfortune. Like previously mentioned with Baldur. The dude was up to a lot of bad stuff. Bad stuff. Now he's a superhero. Or supervillain, actually. Number seven, Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil is the immense and central anchor that is the Norse worlds. Surrounded by the nine worlds, that is. Where the gods often meet to talk about god stuff, which is really important. Deliberating and, and all that fun stuff. The tree shares a connection with that of trees in Germanic paganism. Culturally speaking, at least. I mean, come on, you can't blame them. There is something powerful about a large stoic tree that has connections and ties to all the realms. It's almost like they knew how important trees were all the way back then. Kind of needed them to breathe. And and for a guy with asthma, that's uh, <laughs> that's pretty important. I gotta breathe. <laughs> Do I go up a flight of stairs and I'm just <laughs> I don't even smoke either. Number six, Thor's hammer. Probably the most recognizable piece of Norse mythology is Thor's thick and heavy hammer. Yes, that was an innuendo. It's a big one. Loki had been getting up to no good, as per usual, no surprise there, and decided to play some more tricks. These tricks got him into some trouble, so he then thought he'd make it up by playing more tricks on the Master Smiths, the, the dwarves. Not really a good thought process there. A competition was put in place to see who could make the best gifts for the gods. After a lot of gold and a boat that would fit in your pocket, everyone else was kind of just feeling meh, nothing special. However, that was until the reveal of Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. Nice. That had the crowds ooing and awing. A hammer that would never shatter, always hit its mark, and return to Thor when thrown. Now that's a pretty good hammer. Gather around the Yule Log for number five, Yule itself. That fun little YouTube video a lot of people put on their TV whilst opening presents Christmas morning is actually its own holiday. Yule is a period between winter solstice and the blot ritual done for that solstice. It's speculated to be somewhere around January 12th each year. The reason it's celebrated, once again, is lost to history, but speculation is, is that it honors the dead, the new year, and to celebrate Thor and the coming sunlight he brought as days become longer. We know that there's a multi-day feast and alcohol paired with singing and games. Vikings would make a sun wheel that they would set on fire and roll down a hill in honor of the sun's return. Sounding like a party to me. Naturally, they made yule logs decorated with yews, hollies, and firs alongside carved runes. A piece of this yule was kept every year until the next yule to protect the family and be the start of the first fire of next year. Yule is actually the basis for most Christmas traditions. The yule log, decorating a Christmas tree, ornaments, caroling, making cookies, so much more. This is actually because when Christianity 
was forcing its way in, they needed to up conversion. But no one was interested in monotheism. So they created Christmas and they used the Yule traditions as a basis in order to convince people to convert. They also took St. Nicholas and the concept of stockings, which were boots originally, from Eastern Europe and the Balkan region to convert them. Clever Christians used people's pre-existing cultures under a new name to have them join them for a lot of different things. What they didn't take, however, was the unsettling detail that every ninth year of Yule, it was customary for Swedish kings to sacrifice men at the temple of Uppsala. Nine heads would be offered to the gods with the bodies hanging out of the temple's sacred grove. This would go on for nine days, totaling 81 sacrifices that would be accompanied by feasts and Yule festivities. Number four is Zombie Avoidance 101. A suspicious amount of cultures speak of the undead creatures rising at night to torment the living that can't enter a door without being invited. It makes you wonder what they saw that we didn't. Called Draugr, Gans and Vikings lived on the assumption once any corpse was buried, it would become animated again. If it were peaceful, then it was called a hog boy, and it would re innocently reside in its grave to protect it from robbers. However, when they weren't peaceful, they were Draugr, wandering away from its burrow to harm any human it could find. Precautions to avoid this included pieces of straw placed in cross formations under the burial shroud, a pair of open scissors placed across the chest, the big toes tied together, and even nails poked into the bottom of feet to make walking out impossible. Even how the coffin bearers would stop before leaving with the coffin, raising it three times in different directions would symbolize a cross. Since Vikings believed the dead could only return the same way that they came, it was believed that the deceased wouldn't be able to enter a house without invitation and a body carried out feet first wouldn't properly see the route back from its burial mound. Once the deceased was out those doors, any jars, saucepans, cauldrons, chairs, clothes, anything used by the deceased that others would later be using was turned upside down. Number three is the baby trials. And yeah, I literally mean a baby going through trials. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not the Olympics, the baby didn't have to like throw a spear or man a viking ship, but they did have to be accepted and acknowledged as a real person. Norse didn't consider babies as humans the second they are born. This may seem strange to us now, but that mentality likely spared immeasurable grief as natural mortality was so high. By having emotional distance, parents were able to protect themselves, an important perspective to remember. With a happy, healthy, and alive baby, the Norse went through a few rituals to humanize it. First, the baby was sat on the ground until the father picked up the child and placed him inside his coat or cloak. This symbolized the father accepted that the baby was his child. Next, they inspected the child to ensure it was healthy. Blindness or deafness wasn't detested, by the way. After those two acceptances, the ceremony of Asa Vatni occurred and they sprinkled fresh water on the baby. The last step was Nathnasti, a naming ritual. The father would state the child's name and bestow a gift, usually things like a ring, farmland, weapon, or even deer. This final acceptance made the baby officially a person and any offense towards it would be penalized as if the baby was an adult. Number two is all kinds of ghastly, the blood eagle. The TV show Vikings brought this torture method to widespread attention. You've likely also seen it in TV show NBC Hannibal or the horror movie Midsommar, a Scandinavian based film. It's a method of execution that could last hours and sometimes days and it was rumored to have killed King Alea in 867 AD. The punished was laid face down, restrained with his arms and legs spread and an eagle was carved into the skin of his back before the skin was peeled back and ribs separated from the spinal cord with an axe. But we aren't done yet. The ribs and muscles are then pulled outwards to represent the wings of an eagle. And of course, salt was then pressed and rubbed into the wound. While the victim is still alive, his lungs are gently lifted out of the body to rest on the stretched out rib bones. As the victim died, his last breaths and the wind amongst him would make the lungs flutter like that of a bird's wing. Jesus, I don't even know how to follow that up with a witty comment, man. I think I'm gonna just move on to the next segment. So number one is somehow more grotesque. It's the berserkers. We all know Vikings were absolute beasts in battle, so you had to know this list was gonna get a little darker towards the end. They had this thing called battle fury, which in recent times we have theorized to be the result of either intentional or accidental use of psychedelic and fungus. This could cause a self-induced hypnotic trance, resulting in them losing their sense of pain and conscious control of their movements. But nothing was more terrifying than a berserker. They took that battle fury and multiplied it by a hundred. They took on the appearance and behavior of either a bear or a wolf, even donning the pelt or the heads of their chosen animal. Oftentimes, that's the only garb they wore at all. Apparently, to reach this status, they lived out in the wild like their totem animal. Being stripped of humanity allowed them to take on the strength and mindset of that creature. So when they 
fought in battle, berserkers apparently used just their bare hands and teeth. And according to legend, they felt no pain and could keep fighting for hours despite any injury. They were said to have even ripped man limb from limb. Imagine going into battle in like 600 AD with an opposing army you've never seen before and then it turns out it's a bunch of 6 foot 11 dudes in animal skins out of their minds on psychedelics and carrying 7 foot swords. Yeah. Number 10, bears for pets. Okay, right off the bat, let's get crazy. Some of the hardest character deaths in Game of Thrones were definitely the dire wolves. Also, spoiler alert, but also you had eight years, so. <laughs> wolves as pets sounds like something Vikings would do for sure, but more often than not, they would just have dogs and cats just like us. Few of these animals were kept as pets, really. They all had a Viking purpose. They all had the big, Cats probably had a big beard too, most likely. Viking cats belonged in the house to chase away rodents, just like they do today. Freya, the goddess of love in Norse mythology, rides in a cart that's being pulled by two cats. The cutest little cart ever. These cats were Egyptian. Most of the cats in Scandinavia came from Egypt at that time, and they adapted to a much colder climate. Viking dogs were also a thing. They were often found in graves next to human remains. So the man's best friend thing goes way back. They were hunting dogs and herding dogs, and they too followed their masters to Valhalla, hence why the bones would always be found together after death. Here's the crazy part though, Vikings would also domesticate bears from cubhood. Yeah, they would have Viking bears as pets. What a fun way to kick this list off. Number nine. Norse paganism. If you're a fan of the MCU, this, uh, this guy Thor here with the cape and the hammer and the big muscles, odds are you've heard of him before Nick Fury introduced you. Thor and Odin, they come from Norse mythology. The Aesir are the main gods of the pantheon. Those include Thor, Odin, and even Loki. And yes, in Norse mythology, they lived on Asgard. It's not just MCU stuff, one of the nine realms. So they believed that if they fought hard enough and lived the most fierce warrior lives they could, they would end up in the halls of Valhalla to join Odin in the fires of Ragnarok, the most fierce battle of all. The Vikings didn't have a name for their religion at first, so when they eventually ran into Christianity, they called it the Old Way, which just sounds cool. It's like, ah, yes, the Old Way. It's referred to today as the Asatro, that's the worship of Norse gods. That term became popular in the 19th century, so it came much later. There was a Nordic religion society in Denmark that had around 600 members, and that was back in 1997, so pretty recently, and it was approved officially in 2003. Believers now can mostly be found throughout Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland. Number eight, horned helmets. Okay, when you think of Vikings, you probably imagine a very large man in a big ass beard with some horns. You got a horn to blow on, a horn to drink wine out of or something, or some ale, and then two horns here on your helmet. Just the horniest fella. Well, aside from looking cool, they would have, well, aside from looking cool, this horned helmet would have served absolutely no purpose to a warrior in combat. I don't know, unless there's a guy out there just headbutting all of his opponents individually, I don't know. The horned helmets were only introduced into Norse culture when costume designer Carl Emil Doppler made them for Norse themed operas in the 19th century. So it's really just modern art that we're thinking of. Also, Thor surely doesn't help. He has like wings on his helmet. I'm like, is that real or is that just Chris Hemsworth? I can't tell the difference. Number seven, hockey. I had to share this one, you know, being a Canadian and all, this one hurt. We found out that hockey wasn't our thing during Canada's 150th celebration. How epic is that? Oops, timing. I'm cold a lot of the time. My face hurts here in Canada. It hurts when I walk to the store and get my weird bagged milk and then I return back to my igloo. You know how it is. That's the idea, right? That Canadians are cold and they play hockey all the time. Well, honestly, yeah, pretty much. Not too far off. Well, hockey isn't just our favorite winter activity. Vikings loved it too. They actually brought it here in the first place, believe it or not. They didn't call it hockey also. They called it a way better name. They called it slap and fatten, which means to slap the fat around. You slap some fat with a stick. Me and the boys are gonna go around and do some road slap and fatten. <laughs> Car, heads up. Pause the slap and fatten. Let's get out of here. Vikings would get sticks and try and slap some fat in between two posts. Imagine getting cross-checked by a Viking. See you later, chest plate. Number six, what's that smell? You would think that just looking at a Viking that they would probably smell bad. I don't know, they're by the sea a lot, they're always damp, there's lots of hair. I mean, the beards alone probably suck up 1% of the ocean, barnacles and all that jazz. But believe it or not, these Vikings didn't smell bad. They were actually known for their hygiene. When excavations were done and all these sites that Vikings lived at, well, rather raided and then lived at, ancient hygiene tools were found. So like tweezers, combs, ear cleaners, they were into it. They weren't lucky enough to have Q-tips back then, so instead they used animal bones, which wouldn't hurt too much. Your eyes wouldn't really roll for that one, I don't think. It's just business, no pleasure. 
Vikings would bathe once a week, which to us sounds like a risky move, but once a week for that time period, that's amazing, that's unheard of. Queen Elizabeth I would only bathe once a month. So put that in comparison. Mind you, when you're hauling gear throughout a forest and then you have to use your ax for four hours straight, you might sweat a little bit more than the queen. Number five, drunk sword fighting and other things. Imagine letting a two year old hold a very sharp broadsword. Sounds like a bad idea, right? Well, nobody seemed to think so when they put swords in the hands of drunk vikings, which let's be honest, that's pretty much what a two year old is, is essentially like a drunk person walking around. Outdoors, vikings constantly wanted to one up each other on the strength meter. They had weightlifting competitions, who could lift the heaviest stones, they wrestled, held archery contests, and of course sword fighting competitions, as well as all the games Bree mentioned above. Were they sober? Probably not. They also had a game called Togo Honk, which was kind of like tug of war. Men would sit on the ground facing one another, press their feet together, and bend their knees. The goal was to try to straighten your opponent's legs and flip him over. Honestly? That sounds like a blast. Do you think it's a smart idea to put a sword in a drunk guy's hand? No, but it was the Viking era. There were literally no rules except for a few. At number four, not enough chairs. Now we know that these Viking celebrations would often last for days on end, right? So imagine if during all that time you couldn't sit anywhere comfortable. Sounds pretty unfortunate, but it was the reality of a lot of Viking parties. Because these gatherings were so big, hundreds of people would be in attendance, but unfortunately there wouldn't be enough space to sit. To try and accommodate their hundreds of guests, Vikings would break out their longest tables and benches, but usually this still wasn't enough space for everyone, so it became kind of a rule that only the most important people were allowed to sit. Chairs are thought to have been pretty rare, so the most powerful and wealthiest Vikings were allowed to sit in chairs. Everyone else had to fend for themselves, either sitting on uncomfortable benches or just standing around. Now doing this for a couple of hours? No problem. For a two week celebration? You can count me the heck out. If my tush she's not comfortable, I'm going home. Number three, fertility celebrations. So we talked a lot about what Vikings actually did back then and how they partied. Uh, they partied pretty hard. But now we're talking about what kind of festivals they had. This holiday is celebrated on April 30th in Finland, Sweden, and Germany, but goes all the way back to the Vikings. This night is called Waluburgas Night, or Waluburgas Night, or I probably said it wrong, but let me know, and is named after a woman called Valborg. She was born in 710, somewhere in Dorset slash Wessex, as the niece of St. Boniface. She traveled with her brothers to Württemberg, Germany and became a nun. She lived in a convent of Heidenheim and became renowned for her healing powers and was canonized as a saint after she died. This celebration is in honor of her, however it was originally a pagan celebration called Beltane, a celebration of the return of summer. Viking fertility celebrations took place in and around April 30th and due to Valborg claiming this date as well, the two celebrations became one and the same eventually. Viking fertility celebrations usually involved sacrificing an animal or two of some kind and included all of the above. At number two, harvest slash winter night celebration. Next up in celebrations to mark on your calendar, we have the harvest slash winter night that took place on October 31st. It can also be referred to as elf blessing, this blessing, or fray blessing. Kind of like our spooky tradition today, it was a time of honoring the ancestral spirits, spirits of the land, the vanir, along with the powers of fruitfulness, wisdom, and of course, death. A little brutal, yet kind of merciful in a way, the animals who weren't weren't going to be able to make it through the winter were smoked or made into sausage. It was often led by the women of the household. They left the last sheep in the field as an offering to Odin, though this varies. It also marks the start of something called the wild hunt. The roads and fields became territory of ghosts and trolls and marks the beginning of the darkest and coldest time of the year. The festivities and feasts are particularly joyous and they mainly aim to celebrate kinship, accomplishments, and the tales of the year. Last but not least, Yule. This last one is perfect for the season we are entering and a great way to end the list. The festival of Yule was, slash kind of still is, a celebration of 12 days. It was the most important of all Norse holidays and began on the night of December 20th. The god Ingvi Freyr rides over the earth on the back of his shining boar, bringing light and love back into the world. Later, Christianity influenced things, changing the god to Baldur, then Jesus who said to be reborn at the festival. For the Vikings, Yule signified the beginning and end of all things taking place at the darkest time of the year. Children were said to leave their boots outside filled with hay and sugar for the gods journey and in return they would receive a little present. 
Sound familiar? On top of that, the celebration would include drinking, feasting, songs, games, banquets, and sacrifices to the gods and the ancestor spirits for the 12 days. They even had what was called a Yule tree, which inspired the use of the Christmas tree today. And we're kicking off this list with blot. These were blood sacrifices that were performed in order to appease the gods. Luckily, blot often refers to sacrifices of animals rather than human beings. Uh, it was often horses or pigs that were used, but the size of the animal was in direct correlation with the level of gratitude they were showing towards the gods. The animals were placed over stone altars before being sacrificed, and their blood was collected in a bowl that would get passed around, and with each person, they would you know take a sip of the bowl. Sometimes twigs were even dipped into the bowls of blood and then shaken around at onlookers, spraying them with droplets of blood, kind of like a, a Jackson Pollock painting is what I picture. The meat of the animal was also doused in its own blood before being feasted on. This was a fairly common practice. It would take place all throughout the year, but now let's move on to a more special Viking tradition. Next up, we have Viking Yule. The Viking Yule festival sounds pretty pleasant. Some of our modern uh, Christmas traditions were inspired by Yule. It feast, burn the Yule log, there was a Yule tree, again, very Christmas reminiscent. Uh, they drank heavily, sounds like Christmas to me. There was one tradition, though, that's thankfully uh, been left out of our modern holiday celebrations, human sacrifice. Yes, every ninth year, during uh, Yule, there would be a total of 81 human sacrifices spanning over nine days. So that's that's nine human sacrifices a day. Yes, kings would sacrifice nine men per day with their heads being offered to the gods. What a, what a way to ring in the holiday season. Ah, happy Yule, Sven. By the way, cancel all your plans because the king just told me you're getting your head cut off this afternoon. This, uh, this isn't even, you know, really all that strange. Human sacrifice has been present all throughout human history, all over the world, really. And it's, it's just kind of funny thinking about how celebratory it was here. Not something that's easy for us modern people to wrap our heads around. The various methods Vikings would use to ward off the Draugr. First off, what is a Draugr? They're uh, basically undead warriors. Zombie Vikings. Yeah, zombies. Scary enough as it is. Imagine facing off against an undead Viking. They were depicted having superhuman strength. They smelt of death and had a ghastly appearance. They would also often be, you know, depicted as blue or like dark, you know, with decay. If you've ever seen uh, the Northmen, uh, you may be familiar with the Draugr. We, we get this awesome fight with one of them. Very cool creatures in Viking folklore. So Vikings being as superstitious as they were sought to prevent the recently deceased from becoming one of these undead entities. And there were several methods they would employ. They would sometimes place a pair of scissors on the chest of the corpse. You know, they'd hide twigs in their clothing or they would drive needles into the bottom of their feet to keep the dead from walking around again. That one makes sense. That's, that's a pretty practical one. They would abandon children deemed sickly or weak. This isn't much of a surprise given that Viking culture was so heavily centered on strength. Vikings were a warrior culture, constantly engaged in battle, so children that were too small or sick were just really of no use. The most common method of ridding themselves of the weak was to just chuck them into the sea or take them deep into the forest where they'd be left to fend for themselves, often freezing to death or becoming a wolf pack's next meal. They didn't just do do this in order to maintain a strong society though. Vikings also lived in a very harsh climate where you know those that were unable to contribute were just really extra mouths to feed. They were a bit of a burden. So yeah, different times. This is also a practice not unique to Vikings though. Another famous group of warriors, the Spartans, dispose of unhealthy children. So yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm glad we live in 2023. Vikings actually dyed their hair. Yes, uh, as it turns out, that class classic image a lot of us have of Vikings in our minds is having long blonde hair and beards. It's not just a myth. I mean, I guess, you know, nobody ever thought the blonde hair thing was a myth necessarily. Many Nordic people have blonde hair, of course, 
but that super extra blonde look really was a thing. The beauty standards in Viking culture called for blonde hair. So for those that didn't have it naturally or just wanted to get it extra blonde, they would have, you know, actually they would they would actually use a uh, specific type of soap that was heavily concentrated and contained high amounts of lye, which we still use today to make stuff like glass cleaner and uh, fertilizer. Actually, this would basically strip their hair of its natural color. They were basically kind of like bleaching their hair, really. It also do the same things uh, to their beards, which oh my god, I can only imagine how dried out that would have made them. Beards, I mean, you gotta you gotta moisturize these things. You know, the, the hair is very different. I bleached my hair before, and it gets super stiff. It's almost like hay at first. So they they must have had some extra crispy beards. Number five, tarring and feathering. Okay, we've all heard about this one. It's brutal, of course, but the most shocking part is how many steps this one involves. You know what I mean? Like you'd think at the feather part, one guy would be plucking. Like, what are we doing? This is insane. I have to go home. This is it's been hours here. This is horrible. This one goes as far back as 832 AD. This disgusting act has been going down for quite a while. Again, it's so many steps. This is horrible. Who invented this? A man stealing on trade journeys was to be tarred and feathered. This was for stealing during journeys. Again, this is what I'm saying about steps here. First, you'd have to shave this Viking's head, which I don't know if you've seen a Viking recently, but that's gonna take a minute. A lot of hair, sure. Then said Viking was covered in tar and then duck feathers chucked on top. Then as if it couldn't get much worse, this poor guy covered in feathers and tar was forced to run between two lines of the men that he lived with and stole from. Now at that point, these other guys would throw stones, bricks, anything painful, you name it. Now anybody caught not throwing an object at the feathery fellow was liable to be fined. So I know it sucks, but grab something and grab it quick. If the thief did make it through this line alive, again, after being tarred and feathered, then he was off the hook from there on out. Then he was, I guess, innocent? I don't know, that's horrible. I, I wouldn't make that, no way. Number four, trial by ordeal. Quite the ordeal indeed. Look, I mentioned ordeal by fire earlier and that's quite a hot mess, but trial by ordeal is, I have no words. Humans are so stupid, honestly. Introduced after Christianity, wild. Trial by ordeal was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. And yeah, spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it made absolutely zero sense at all. Basically, the accused would be placed into the center of everybody, and then they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. Like, they all just beat this person up. It was horrible, to say the least. If they survived all this pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, then they were guilty. Who thought, like, who wrote the rule book on this? That doesn't make any sense. What kind of insanity is going on here? But wait, it gets even better. If their wounds were clean and without infection after three days, then they would be found innocent because it was a sign that the gods had intervened to show their innocence. So, yeah, a lot of steps to be proven innocent and healing apparently is one of them. Who knew? Number three, no insults. Yeah, the YouTube comments section could take a, a note from this one. Here we go. No insults. Be nice. This one's pretty good. This would change the game today. If you hurled insults at somebody back in the Viking age, well, they were entitled to compensation. And they could summon everybody else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, they could be like, hey, you hurt my feelings. Give me $10. I guess that is happening today, but on a much larger scale. Comedians, really. If you spoke bad about somebody during the Viking age, even if the person person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation, right? And because of that, you need to pay them for the possible damages. Again, we see this happen today in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. It's, it's too late, right? You spoke it, now it's out there. You did it. Your reputation was how you gained employment, met friends. It was a really important thing back then, more important than now. Can't be messed with, especially if you're a Viking. Yeah, no way. Also, if you insulted one man, you insulted his entire family as well. You know, the whole Viking rule. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said them to him. So yeah, choose wisely, I guess, with your insults. Number two, rap battles. Before we get to our big bad number one spot on today's list, we have to mention the best part of Viking tradition, in my humble opinion. Battles, but with words. Not with our fists, with our emotions. Flighting, or rap battles, or my favorite part of history, I would have killed it, honestly. I was writing some before lunch and I think I'm okay. During those days, you needed ways to pass time, right? If you couldn't play hockey and there weren't any villages to destroy, what does a Viking do? Why, you have loud poetry, that's what you do. Flighting comes from the old Norse flyta, meaning provocation. It's basically insult exchange, but make it theater. Now it's just 
ASAP Rocky. Norse literature really has tales of their gods fighting. Imagine that. Imagine how cool that would be. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya in some sort of rap circle, some cipher. That'd be amazing. The whole purpose here was not to see who could diss the other's hometown the hardest, but rather this was a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. It's all brains and no brawn. A little different than traditional Viking battles, right? In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast. Imagine that, you'd enjoy a roast while watching a roast in real life. Double the roast, double the fun. Later, this was of course entertainment in the 15th and 16th centuries in Scotland. But don't get it twisted, Viking flighting got pretty intense. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. This was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. Again, if you're eating food right now, maybe give it a break for a minute. I don't know, giving you a heads up. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, historically, who both happened to be members of the royal family, they were both in the prone position, right? So they would lie flat on their tummies, then they would have their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create the sort of like, um, what do you, wings, I guess. Just like a nice lungy pair of wings. We love a creative Viking, I guess. Now, both instances where this insane punishment is said to have went down, historically, both of them were accused of killing their own fathers. So, I don't know what was going on back then or who's doing what, but got some daddy issues that are not being handled well at all. So don't do that, I guess. Don't do any part of that at any time. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? I can barely carve a pumpkin in one go. You know what I mean? My wrist gets tired. I can't do that. It's a lot of work. Number 10 is suspicious hygiene. Well, at least it was suspicious to others, but to the Scandinavians and their Vikings, it was actually incredibly common and important. They had a weekly resume for their cleaning their bodies or the cleaning of their clothes. This is where the unsettling part does come in though. See, in traditional Nordic beliefs, it is suggested that since you never knew the day of your death, you should always look your best for the inevitable arrival in the afterlife. This is because when you die, you will be in the presence of your gods and any soul that has departed before you. So by dressing and grooming yourself daily in a clean manner, you ensure that you would not have to be ashamed. And it also had cosmic significance in maintaining order and staving off the cataclysm of Ragnarok, which would end the world. So to break that down, they were hygienic because how However they died is how they would meet their gods, looking like that, and also it would help prevent an apocalypse. Okay. So the Viking reputation for being well groomed comes from Christian accounts condemning such behavior as vain and posturing, which seduced Christians into emulating their evil pagan ways and doing so angered the Christian god. In reality, chroniclers were just pissed that the Vikings were kicking their asses and stealing their women. A famous example of this resentment towards Viking superiority and well hygiene is after some Vikings did a sacking of a monastery in 790. Scholar Alcuin wrote multiple letters to English kings denouncing those Christians who had begun dressing and caring for themselves as the pagan Vikings did, since this obviously incurred God's wrath. What you give is whatever you get with number nine, blot sacrifices. The concept of this ritual is an exchange. By sacrificing to the gods with certain items or certain requests, the Vikings could receive something in return. Sometimes it would be a request for fertility or goodwill regarding the weather or the harvest. Sometimes it was luck in battle. It's believed that there are four of these blots that were done during the year at the time of the autumn and spring equinox and the summer and winter solstices. One of the few documented blots in history is documented by Icelander named Snorri in the early 1200s, who described how all the farmers of the area had gathered at the temple to make sacrifice, and a meal was provided by Sigurd Hackenson, a generous man of wealth. Multiple animals were sacrificed, primarily horses, and the blood was collected all in bowls, being that the participants used twigs to splatter the blood along the stone altars, walls and the participants themselves. Then they cooked the meat via boiling in cauldrons and blessed it by a god's priest, and then some was eaten by all in attendance. Beer was also blessed, then consumed with it. They would make a toast to Odin and decree to the king and victory before emptying cups for Njord and Frej to secure a prosperous and peaceful future. After all was done, they made final toast to their kin who had now been resting in burial mounds. Number eight is worshipping whites. So Nordic history is sadly lost because of how Christianity colonized the country. When they invaded, they didn't just erase history, they actually buried it. So cultural hubs and temples were made of wood and they were torn down and burned on the spot. Then on their exact foundations, new wooden churches were built. Those were later torn down or fell from natural elements and new stone churches were built on those foundations. When those crumbled, 
they buried history even further beneath the foundation. During this Christianization, the missionaries were more focused on suppressing the belief of named gods like Thor, Odin, Frigga, you get the idea. But smaller collectives of deities got to continue on without awareness of Christian authorities for a little. This is why we have some paper documentation of the worship of whites. Whites were protective deities on areas of land and there were many religious rules for how to deal with them to avoid conflicts. It's debated what whites are fully. Some say they are undead ghosts or they're nature spirits. What's agreed upon is their claim as land protectors. They are tied to the landscape, often to a certain rock or a mountain or even a valley itself. When Egil Skallagrimson was driven from Norway to exile in Iceland, he decided to piss off some rights in revenge. He erected a nithing pool on white land to frighten and enrage them, bringing all of Norway bad luck. It said Iceland is protected by four of these whites and they have taken the form of a bull, eagle, dragon, and giant that will kill or decimate any invaders attempting to approach. They are depicted on Iceland's coat of arms. Pisser get off the pot is number seven. Like the ancient Greeks, the Vikings also had a portable and creative fire that they equipped towards enemies. Unlike Greek fire, which still remains unexplained, we figured this one out. And I'm sure you can guess what it is from the title. I have no idea what they were doing or trying to accomplish, but when Vikings boiled a bunch of urine with a piece of tree bark fungus called touchwood together for days on end, that fungus could then be pounded flat into a strip of like felt material. Then these pieces of material could be ignited and literally tossed around. Again, no idea how they came across this combination or why they were boiling it in the first place. All we know is that this is what they figured out. Anyways, these urine saturated strips were flammable due to the sodium nitrate in urine. Paired with the spores in the mold, they created a smolder effect instead of an inferno. So they were quite convenient for setting campfires or portable fuel for cooking rigs. Either way, the Vikings carried piss grenades and I think that's pretty wild. Number six makes me cringe, it's tooth modification. As forementioned, Vikings cared a lot about their appearances, bleaching hair, combing beards, herbs in the armpits, ironing clothes with rocks, and apparently modifying their teeth. What do I mean by modification? Well, prepare to flinch like crazy because archaeologists have found multiple Viking skulls where there are intentional shape changes to teeth or grooves, dots, and other patterns carved into them. It's primarily been the top front teeth and researchers believe that the grooves were filled with dyes like reds and purples. Due to the Christianization I previously described, there are no records explaining this practice and it's unknown to us until we even discovered these skulls with modifications. There is some assumption that maybe it was earned or associated with a level of status, perhaps even used by warriors to incite fear in their opposition. What we do know is this practice was not seen anywhere else in the Caucasus and European regions at that time and further information just remains lost. At number five, building fires. The Vikings were some pretty innovative people, but they were also kind of gross. This gross behavior applied to a lot of things, but one of those things was their fire building. Now you're probably asking yourself, Bree, what's so gross about making a fire? Well, it's the way that they started the fire that was kind of grody. You see, nowadays we have a bunch of things that we can use to start a fire. We have matches, lighters, lighter fluid, and a bunch of other things. But obviously back in the days of the Vikings, they didn't have those fire starting tools, and so they had to improvise. The Vikings came up with a nifty little trick to start a fire where they took a fungus called touchwood and they would beat it and burn it until it turned into a thin flat thing that kind of looked like felt. Then they decided to get gross and would then boil the touchwood in human urine because urine contained sodium nitrate, which would help the touchwood turn into something that would smolder rather than burn. They could then take this stuff with them and use it to start fires whenever they wanted so they could cook food over their urine fueled fire. Sounds delightful. And number four, conning. Conning people has been something that's kind of been part of many societies since probably the dawn of civilization. Anyone can con anyone into doing anything or buying anything. I mean, people do it on eBay all the time. But apparently, the Vikings were also known to con people probably for their own enjoyment, because they're Vikings. Back in the day, the Vikings would do trades with the Inuit people and they would acquire narwhal tusks from them. The Vikings would then sell those tusks to other people, marketing them as unicorn horns, and let's face it, no one's gonna turn down buying a unicorn horn. Because of the Vikings and their conning ways, by the Middle Ages, people not only believed that unicorns were actually real, but that they also had magical powers. So in a way, if you were obsessed with unicorns as a kid, you can thank the Vikings for that. 
At number three, house bears. Humans seem to be pretty good at domesticating animals. We domesticated dogs by accident and now they're considered man's best friend. We domesticated livestock for food and other purposes. We domesticated horses to be our transportation and carry things. So we kind of know our way around animals and could probably make anything into our pet if we really wanted to. But the Vikings weren't just satisfied with dogs, horses, and livestock. They were the mighty Vikings and they needed mighty pets. And that's why they kept bears as their companions. Yes, bears. Now don't get me wrong, the Vikings also had normal pets like dogs and cats, and they would even sometimes bring them along on their expeditions, but they also really liked bears. It is said that when they weren't out laying siege to someone's town or sailing the seas, the Vikings would visit bear dens and take bear cubs home with them. They would then raise the cubs as house bears. But having a house bear was also a very big responsibility. You had to make sure that your bear was kept in check at all times, so that meant no eating people or livestock, no disturbing your neighbors, and if your bear did get into trouble, you would either get hit with a fine or be banned from having a house bear. So maybe it's best to stick with normal pets like dogs. At number two, worthy kids. The Vikings were ruthless even when it came to their spawn. I mean their kids. These guys were really picky when it came to having a family because they weren't afraid to just yeet their kids if they didn't like them enough. Back in their day, when a baby was born, they would christen their kid with a name during a ceremony called Asavatni, but only after determining if this kid was even worth raising in the first place. You see, when a baby was delivered, the child would be placed on the ground for the father to then pick up and examine. He would be looking for any physical deformities, disabilities, and to determine if the kid was actually his or not. He would decide if the kid had a future. If they did, then they would hold the Asavatni ceremony where water was sprinkled on the kid's head and given a name, and if they weren't worth then they would be left outside in the elements and abandoned. And finally at number one, criminal profiling. It turns out that the Vikings kind of invented criminal profiling. You see, when the Viking horde would set off to battle, there was no telling how they would return. You have to remember that these guys were bloodthirsty and violent and there was no telling what was going on in their heads. I mean, don't even get me started on the whole berserker rage thing because that itself is very intense. But basically, when the Horde would return home, they seemed to have caused a lot of problems because many of them couldn't turn off their rage and would just wreak havoc on the town. To deal with this, it is said that a series of Icelandic sagas were written as a sort of profile to warn the homegrown Vikings of what to look out for when the others would return. They had to kind of alter their stories a little bit because if they were too specific, then it would have caused people to learn to be afraid of basically any Viking man. So they had to keep things a little generic, but for the most part, people learned to stay away from those who couldn't turn off the berserker rage at home in order to keep themselves and the rest of their community safe. At number 10, non-stop party. What is the longest amount of time you've gone out to party? A couple hours, maybe a weekend? Well, I don't think it could ever compare to how long the Vikings partied. The Vikings would have probably had a good old chuckle if they knew our parties only lasted a few hours. They'd be like, ha, look at these weaklings. Anyway, these guys could probably out party anyone. Their biggest festivities, like the ones held after large expeditions or for weddings, would typically last for days, but their major feasts, like the ones they would use to celebrate the winter solstice may have lasted upwards of 12 days. Now that's a lot of party stamina. I would probably need about 50 Red Bulls to even try and keep up with these Vikings. Number nine, actual really good food, like pretty decent food. If you're a foodie, then I do have some good news for you. The Vikings were apparently like pretty decent cooks. For the time, anyways. They stocked their parties with roasted meats like poultry, horse, and beef, with platters of greens, fruits, and buttered vegetables. Beer, ale, mead, and fruit wines were the common beverages, and heavy drinking was encouraged. Not unlike bars today, where there's always that one person who keeps secretly buying tequila shots for everybody, and then you're like, okay, fine, I'll take it because I don't want to be rude, you know what I mean? Anyways, considering the fact that parties would sometimes last for weeks on end, having a lot of food in their party hut was super important. They needed enough to last them until the partying was done, which who knows when that would be. At number eight, rap battles. Every party has to have some kind of activity, right? I mean, yeah, we can all stand around listening to music and kicking it up, but it's way more fun to have activities to participate in, right? Well, the Vikings certainly knew how to throw a party because they had their collection of party activities to choose from, and it sounded kind of like a hoot and a half until we get to the other parts of this list and, you know, just throw that out the window. They would set up games like dice and chess, or at least their early Viking version of chess, and even board games. The Vikings also had this super fun 
fun drinking game called Flighting, where partygoers would team up and recite poetry. They would drop some sick bars about their conquests and exploits, and would even drop a diss or two at their opponents. Like a Drake versus Kanye moment. Oh, wait, no, they're friends now. Damn. Well, scratch that last part, but you know what I mean. On top of rap battles and board games, Viking parties just wouldn't be a proper event without drinking, and they even played a game to see who could drink the most. Honestly, I kind of feel bad for the Vikings livers after all that, and imagine that hangover. Yikes. Number seven, vicious tunes. Ever had a neighbor who would decide to throw a banger on like a weekday? Or have a roommate who thinks they are really good at guitar and wants to like prove it 24 seven, they're like, Wah! like 4 a.m. Yeah, it sucks. If you don't enjoy scenarios similar to this, then you would not want to live next door to a Viking encampment. These folks rocked out really hard and for, as we know, a long period of time. They loved live music, as do I, and archaeologists have recovered flutes, hornpipes, and stringed instruments from settlements. But as most of the singers were well into the mead, according to Arab travelers, they weren't easy on the ears? Like picture the moment Bohemian Rhapsody comes on in a bar and the screeches sounds everyone makes as they try to say Galileo like really loud. My voice is dead. That would be awful. One account described their singing comparable to the calls of wild animals. Oh boy, that's, that's rough. But sometimes they would switch it up with some poetry as mentioned by skilled artists called Scalds. At number six, full send or no send. It seems like the Vikings lived by the notion full send or no send because man, did things get wild and crazy at their parties. There was no holding back with these guys. Oh no. I know I previously mentioned some of the activities that the Vikings would have at their parties, but those ones were the tame ones. And if you know the Vikings, they can't have PG friendly shindigs. Of course not. There's gotta be scenes of violence and coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Other than playing chess and having rap battles, they also had mass casualties. They played games where people literally kicked the bucket, but I guess dying at a party this wild is a good enough way to go. Some of their more dangerous party activities included throwing leftover bones at one another with the deliberate intent of inflicting bodily harm. They also played a full contact bat and ball game that would often end in injury or the big sleep. And they also held a swimming contest, but there wasn't that much actual swimming involved since the point of the game was to hold their opponent underwater for as long as possible. I would have to imagine that these so called games would just make for a vicious cycle because they'd celebrate something, play these games, kill someone, and then the funeral will have them celebrating again just to do it all over again. What a wild life these Vikings lived. At number five, Mead and Poetry. There are many creation stories for Norse gods that are pretty weird. The gods were created from all kinds of things and it's a little complex, but one of the weirder creation stories is that of the god Kvasir, known to be the wisest of them all. The story goes that the gods just won a war and they were looking to celebrate their victory with a special drink. They all chewed berries and spat them out to ferment them and create alcohol. However, instead of making a drink, they made a person and that person was Kvasir. His name literally translates to fermented berry juice, so it really doesn't get more straightforward than that. This new god became the smartest god to have ever existed. He was known to share his wisdom with anyone who would listen and traveled far and wide to share his knowledge. Sadly though, he was too wise for everyone and Kvasir was killed by dwarves and they drained his blood. They then used this blood to create a special kind of mead that, that granted poetic skills to those who drank it. It is believed that this drink was the birth of poetry, so Kvasir's death ended up creating something beautiful after all. Number four, kitten footsteps. If you have a dog that's a little tempestuous and keeps breaking out of their collar, then listen up. We've been doing it all wrong. The strongest collar is one that's embedded with the sound of cat footsteps, such as the one used to keep Fenrir at bay. Fenrir was a colossal wolf offspring of the god Loki because again, he was super creative when it came to having kids. The gods were so afraid of him that out of the three monsters Loki had, this one they kept under lock and key. They reared him up as a puppet and the only god fearless enough to approach him was Tyre, the upholder of law and order. As it grew, they kept putting chains on the beast, clapping every time Fenrir broke through them to disguise their intent as a test of strength. But soon they sought out the dwarves, because they were awesome, for their skill. 
They forged a chain of unequivocal strength. Instead of metal, it was made from the sound of cats' footsteps, the beard of a woman, the roots of mountains, the breath of fish, and the spittle of bird. All things that don't exist. When they showed Fenrir, he suspected something was up because it was so light. So he asked for a god to put their hand in his mouth as collateral. Tyre did so, knowing that he would lose his hand because it was going to work. He did, and Fenrir, unable to break it, was transported to an isolated keep, and there he stayed until Ragnarok. Because he's going to kill Odin. At number three, target practice. We all know about Odin's son Thor. He is the most famous child of the Norse Allfather, but you might not know about Odin's other son, Baldur. Baldur was known for being well liked by everyone. Well, maybe not everyone. Loki was the one person who didn't like Baldur, and he ended up being Baldur's undoing. One night, Baldur started having nightmares where he pictured his own death. This had his mom really worried, and so, as any mother would do, she sought out to protect her child at all costs. She went to everyone and everything in existence, including inanimate objects, and she asked them to take an oath promising to never hurt Baldur. These oaths were no joke, and as everyone agreed to take this oath, this essentially made Baldur invincible. The gods found this so great, so they made a game where they would use Baldur as target practice and would throw weapons and other miscellaneous items at him, only for all of them to just bounce right off of him. This was all fun and games until Loki got fed up with Baldur being the center of attention. Loki ended up finding the one thing that Baldur's mother did not get an oath from, and that was mistletoe. Loki then made a spear out of mistletoe, and the next time the gods played their game with Baldur, Loki gave the spear to someone who threw it at Baldur, and then he died. Number two, a naughty little squirrel. Everyone has that friend that loves the drama so much that most of the time they are the drama. And of course, everyone has had squirrels ruin their gardens or outdoor wiring at some point. How on earth do these two things relate? Well, let me introduce you to Ratatosk. In Norse mythology, all creatures live on the tree of life, which includes a little squirrel who loves to cause the drama. Specifically between a dragon and an eagle who live on the tree. Ratatosk's job is to ferry messages throughout the tree and quite often the dragon and the eagle love to insult each other. The squirrel loves it so much that he will even lie to keep it going, but it doesn't stop there. He will even spread gossip and unrelated news to the other gods. The squirrel will do anything to keep the hatred flowing throughout the tree, which somehow explains how rude squirrels are most of the time. Like honestly, what the heck? Except one time, one came up on my shoulder and like just hung out and it was really nice. So they're not all bad. Finally, at number one, Thor the Bride. If you know anything about Thor, it's that he loves his hammer Mjolnir more than anything, and if he loses it, he would move heaven and earth to get that sucker back. Well, Thor's hammer was once stolen by a giant named Thrym, and Thor and Loki came up with an insane plan to get it back. Thor tried to negotiate with the giant to give him back his hammer, but the giant said that the only way he would return Mjolnir to Thor was if he could marry Freya. That was certainly not going to happen, at least not for real. Thor decided to impersonate Freya instead and marry the giant, and when Loki caught wind of this plan, he decided to join. Loki disguised himself as a handmaiden in order to watch this whole thing unfold. The giants ended up buying Thor and Loki's disguises, and they made it to the wedding feast. The giants were getting a little suspicious because he seemed manly, and especially when it came to his appetite, but that didn't matter in the long run because the moment that Thor was able to get his hands on Mjolnir, he not only left the giant at the altar, but he killed the giant and all of the wedding guests too. Sounds like the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones, honestly. Number 10, Boulder. When looking at ancient myths and stories for a while, you'll come to notice some shocking similarities in these cultures stories. Some of these cultures interacted with one another and some did not, which to me says we're just good storytellers. The tale of Boulder is like that of Achilles, a young and strong warrior made invincible by his mother. Mothers have that ability. Achilles was dipped in the river Styx. Baldur was given a spell, each with their own weakness and each with their own invulnerability. Achilles and his heel, Baldur and, uh, well, a, a mistletoe. Loki made a dart out of one and uh, Baldur wasn't so invincible anymore. Boy, that Loki guy sure causes a lot of trouble. Also, if you played God of War, the climactic scene at the end with Baldur, ooh, especially troubling. You know what I'm talking about. Good stuff, good story. Number nine, Yggdrasil. The big bad tree that you see every time you see Norse stuff. 
a connection between all the nine realms in a place where Norse gods deliberate on godly matters. I don't know what that is, but they talk there sometimes. It's kind of like when your parents talk in the room. You know what they're talking about, but you know what's important. It's almost as if people knew how important trees were. I mean, we use trees for everything. Paper, houses, sometimes people on the west coast are like a different kind of tree. You know what I'm saying there, brother? <laughs> I got Chris, I got him, he's laughing. I like to make Chris laugh. You guys gotta laugh sometimes. The tree is life. It represents life, brother. Kind of like what trees actually do in real life. I swear, one of the first lessons I ever got in school was that tree equals good, and we need tree, so don't cut down tree. We need to breathe, please. I swear it was one of my first lessons. Maybe because I'm we're Canadian, I grew up in the in the fort, like in the hillbilly country. I don't know, but that's what I learned. Number eight, Ragnarok. The apocalypse, the end times. When mom says I have to eat my dinner before I eat cookies. Oh, it's the end of the world. Uh, let's be honest, I never really had an issue with eating. Come on, let's be, let's be real here, come on. Ragnarok is the prediction of end times, and every civilization has their own. Ragnarok is slightly different though from its counterparts, as instead of one event like a giant tsunami or a flood, it's more of a series of events that are the signs of end times. Kind of like uh, Call of Duty. First it was greedy microtransactions, then it was jetpacks. Lately, it just unbalanced hackers. All signs of the end times. Number seven, Loki. Lord of tricks, god of mischief. Everyone knows who Loki is, most likely due to some very successful superhero movies in the last few years. But the same may know him regardless. Known for many tricks and evil deeds. His best trick, or whatever you want to call it, is shape-shifting. Loki has the ability to transform into any creature and any gender. Which to me, that's just the best superpower. I mean, come on, you can legit be any living thing. That's gotta be cooler than a shield or just getting really green and angry. And for people that don't have that ability to see through these tricks, it often leads to a lot of misfortune. Like the previously mentioned Balder and perhaps another related story that I'll get to later, we'll see. Number six, Valkyries. Oh yes, the beautiful Valkyries. For such a gorgeous image, they have a rather grim job. Whenever someone falls in battle, it's up to these lovely ladies to guide them to the afterlife. In a way, they're kind of like battle angels. Pretty cool. It literally translates to chooser of the slain. Norse mythology, like a lot of others, has its fair share of violence, but hey, I guess if I fell in battle, I'd want to be carried off by a gorgeous woman who can fly. I hope you folks have been praying towards Odin, otherwise you won't be able to make it to Valhalla, which is bad because that's where all the good little Viking men and women go. So they can be with their ancestors and drink meat all day, which, dude, drinking, you ever had meat? It's delicious. Yes, please. Sign me up. Oh, I love mead so much. Speaking of cosmetics though, let's talk about Vikings teeth for a moment. Having nice teeth, it's a sign of attractiveness, good health, but these ancient warriors would modify their teeth for reasons that aren't 100% confirmed, but we can speculate that it was to make them appear more fierce, because uh, I don't think Vikings were all too concerned with pretty, other than their gorgeous blonde locks. Skeletal remains of ancient Norsemen had been dug up in Sweden and in parts of Denmark with horizontal grooves kind of carved and cut into the front of their teeth. For the most part, they were just horizontal lines, but uh, there had been other shapes uh, found as well. Again, it's not 100% known why some of them did this, but it's said that maybe they dyed the grooves to create kind of cool lines on their teeth, almost like tattoos. It would have been extremely uh, painful, as you can probably imagine. Nobody likes going to the dentist. And it wasn't super common, but it was definitely a bit of an ancient Swedish trend. There are plenty of cultures all around the world that would also do something similar to this, but Vikings are the only known culture in medieval Europe to have practiced it. Next on the list, we have swords. And what's there are several traditions held at Viking weddings that are rather familiar. The bride and groom would exchange rings, they would celebrate with a feast, there would be animal sacrifices, all pretty standard. But unsurprisingly, swords also played a major role in Viking weddings because of course they did. First of all, the groom's buddies would hide a sword in the grave of one of their ancestors, which the groom would then have to find and retrieve, kind of like a, a sword scavenger hunt. 
pretty fun. If I ever got married, I, I might want to incorporate that somehow. And then when it came to the actual wedding ceremony, the bride and groom would exchange rings, yawn, but they would also exchange swords. These swords would have been passed down through their family and the exchange of the blades symbolized the union of the two families that were now there to protect one another. It's actually quite a lovely idea, really. The Viking funeral. We've all seen this one in movies and shows before. It's that classic ritual where a warrior or king is sent out on his ship and burned at sea. There's a, a common misconception that this is pretty much how all Viking funerals took place, but this was really more reserved for higher ranking members of society as ships were expensive and, you know, kind of important to people who would like raid villages and travel around the world. But the first step was to prepare the body of the deceased. It would be washed, dressed in its best clothes, and adorned with jewelry and other belongings. It was then placed on a wooden boat. The boat was filled with the deceased's possessions, weapons, food, sometimes even livestock, or even a sacrificed slave. Family members would often place personal items and offerings in the boat as well. Once everything was set though, the body was taken to the funeral site. The boat was then set ablaze, either by a torch or a flaming arrow, and then the flames of course would consume the boat and the possessions of the deceased, releasing the soul of the departed to the afterlife. The Vikings believed the higher the flames, the better the chances of the deceased's successful journey into the afterlife. So family members would often add oil or other flammable liquids to the fire to ensure a bigger, you know, brighter blaze. And you know, why not? I mean, if I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go out as you know a big a fire as possible. You know, go out with a blaze of glory. The blood eagle. All right, this one is pretty gruesome, so uh, fair warning. It seems as though Vikings could get pretty creative with their methods of torture. The blood eagle was a nasty practice in which the unlucky recipient is restrained, lying face down on the ground. Then the image of an eagle with its wings spread out was carved into the victim's back. Already sounds awful, but nowhere near finished. Typically using an ax, each of the victim's ribs were then separated from their spine and kind of like splayed out. So in the end, they'd have almost this, this appearance of wings coming out of their back. Pretty creative, hence, hence, hence the name. Hold on though, still not done. Sometimes if they were feeling extra feisty, it even rub salt into the wound at this point by literally rubbing salt into the open wound. And just to top it all off, the lungs were then pulled out and splayed over the exposed ribs, which would then kind of flutter in the wind like a, like a bird's wings. Vikings would often perform this horrific ritual on their worst enemies or even members of their own uh, society who had been deemed dishonorable. So yeah, living in the Viking age would have been uh, even more brutal than you may have thought. It's not a hundred percent known once again, if this ever actually happened or if it was more of a tall tale, but I don't know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. It was really a thing. People can be, people can be pretty messed up even nowadays, so you can only imagine what people were, were up to back then. And coming in at first place is the practice of awaking one's berserker power. Berserkers are not just a thing of myth. These barbaric warriors were really said to have existed and the method of becoming a berserker was pretty brutal. They would undergo a process of kind of death and rebirth, stripping themselves of their humanity to live in the wilderness as the animal they represented. There are kind of three types of berserkers that are kind of known to have existed. Uh, there are wolf kind of ones, bear ones, some kind of took on the appearance of a boar. It would hunt like animals, raid villages with a ruthless animalistic fury. For their battles, they would enter into this almost trance-like state after performing dances and howling and roaring at the sky. They often fought completely naked too, which would also be, imagine just an army of big naked men roaring like animals rushing in from the forest to raid your village. Berserkers just evoke such awesome imagery and it's no wonder they're some of the most iconic uh, warriors in history.